is Supreme Ruler 2030 just a reskin of Supreme Ruler Ultimate? Hello, my name's Rosola. This video is part of my Supreme Ruler 2030 coverage playlist, which you can find at the top right in the cards or in the description below. So for the question at hand today, this is actually one of the most, if not the most common questions that I personally have received not just questions, but also insinuations, as it's not just something that has been asked of me by those that I know and viewers, but also I've seen viewers express disinterest in the title. Their reasoning being that they see that it will be more of a, for example, power and revolution yearly update, but more of a decade update. They don't see that it's going to be a massive improvement or any big difference. And it doesn't just end with viewers, you know, the ones that don't even play the games. It also has infiltrated my own Supreme Ruler group. Shibi, a name you might know from my Supreme Ruler Ultimate playthroughs, expressed a similar yet stronger disinterest in even trying the game because he expressed that, with his knowledge, that the game would just be Supreme Ruler Ultimate but it would run better, and that's it. Well, I'm going to make my argument of why Supreme Ruler 2030 is actually a vast improvement over Supreme Ruler Ultimate and summarize a little bit at the ending. I have 10 reasons for you, so let's get started with the first one. Now, this first one is more like three of them in one. However, it's kind of what everybody thinks will be different and only this so i'm going to tackle this all in one point and that is that it's updated it's a new engine with a graphical update a performance update and ui changes this alone is huge the game is now running 64 bit which raises the internal number limits of what can be possible like regional limits it raises the amount of ram that the system can use and allow it to just utilize your hardware more efficiently to allow more efficient and upgraded graphics which is why we're going to be seeing updated graphics as well and the ui is also being very well redesigned as we can see in numerous progress videos and screenshots from what you might be used to in supreme ruler ultimate these are big differences which are not only going to affect how the game runs but how the game plays and how it can be improved upon in the future with updates potential expansions or dlc and even whatever sequel ends up coming from it. And you know how I referenced those internal numbers being able to be higher? Well, this leads into point number two, which is the presence of a regional loyalty system. Now that nations are not so capped out on how many we can fit on the map, we can now have regions within our nations and regional loyalties which can play out and lead to a bunch of different scenarios. In this particular point, I'm talking about regional loyalties. You may know the loyalty system from SRU already. This is a system that determines what country a land pledges its loyalty to. And in SRU, this mainly just has effects on line of sight, as well as the efficiency of the production economy within a region, as well as also depending on what settings you set up for your game, maybe also supply spread as well. Well, in this game, it's being vastly expanded on with regions within our nations. For example, there could also be the simulated regions of like Siberia, Quebec, as well as places within China, such as Tibet, having their own constant regional loyalty. And now this is a lot different to national loyalties because these regions mean that a nation will always, almost always, be built up of smaller nations that have their own sort of internal politics. You'll be able to interfere in the affairs of another region, whether it is within another nation or it is within its own nation. Sounds kind of similar to something like Crusader Kings and the feudal system. For example, China could try to get Texas to secede or California from America, or America could try to get Siberia to leave Russia. All these kinds of things open up. This adds an insane new level of detail and a whole new dimension of how you are going to interact with politics and other nations within Supreme Ruler 2030. And now that leads me to point number three, which is a changing of the fund insurgency feature. At least from what I read, this feature is going to be notably different in Supreme Ruler 2030, where I read from one of the developers, Chris himself, saying that fund insurgency will now be able to spawn partisans 
within a region, something that before only happened based on law enforcement spending, but also influence elections within regions, which could potentially maybe lead to a breakaway succession. So this might be how this can tie into regional loyalty, but also the reason why I'm separating this as its own point is because this is how you could potentially start a full-on civil war or rebellion within a nation, something unseen of in SRU without some sort of script to start it. Maybe even the ability for a coup, which again, only scripted in prior Supreme Ruler games. I think that point number four transitions from here pretty nicely as we talk about changes to things in modern diplomacy. As I talked about in the community wishlist video, which I posted prior, that's something you can also check out in this playlist. But for example, how aerial incursions are no longer automatic free war declarations with no penalties. Because in real life, that's just not really a thing. If I fly over your country, you aren't necessarily going to declare war on me for it. You might shoot the plane down, and I won't necessarily declare war on you for that. This is a normal thing, something they'll hopefully expand upon. But changes in the diplomacy system to more accurately represent modern diplomacy coming along is only a good thing and will, once again, drastically change how you can interact with other countries on the map. Now you can actually harass another country in some way, you know, without it leading to all out permanent never ending war until you fully conquer your opponent. Speaking of wars and opponents, that leads me to number five, where even just creating and finding out what to do with units is going to be completely different now. In SRU, when you were done with a unit, and AI as well, they would either start stacking up to the point where there was too many, or they'd be traded privately between one nation and another, and then depending on your settings could literally stack up on the map indefinitely. Or the thing that players usually do that I saw, and that some AI even end up doing when they get too many units rather than selling, is just scrapping the units for military goods. Well, now there's a whole new thing. You know the world market where you trade all of your goods. Well, now Battle Goat has added one for units. So whether they be older units that you simply do not want anymore or newer units that you are specifically producing in order to try to spin a profit on, you will be able to take your units, put them on a world market and sell them to the highest bidder. Now, countries that are not as technologically advanced as everybody else won't need to rely on a non-existent excess stock of weaponry and equipment in other nations that they can purchase privately in order to be able to fight wars on a more present and modern scale. Now they'll just be able to go to the market and sure the highest tech stuff still may not be there, but there should be enough stuff of a scale of technological capabilities that even the poorest African country could probably raise an army that could give someone else a lot of trouble, especially their neighbors, if they're smart enough to use this new feature. Speaking of AI, that leads me to point number six. I've already made a dedicated video on this point if you want to find that in the playlist, but the way AI even move around the map is going to be vastly different as now with a new waypointing system, a global waypointing system that's predefined into the game's map, AI will be able to more efficiently find their way around the world, preventing SRU release type issues such as France trying to blaze through the Soviet Union in order to reach the war in Indochina, and hopefully also the inability of Western Hemisphere nations to participate in any of the world's conflicts in the Eastern Hemisphere and vice versa. I mean, this point is huge. This would completely radically change how every scenario in Supreme Ruler Ultimate went if you had too many important AI in one hemisphere that wasn't directly involved in the land fighting. And now speaking of scenarios, that leads me to bring up point number seven. Point number seven is the presence of campaigns. Now Supreme Ruler Ultimate already had campaigns, but almost all of them were historical in nature. There were a couple of modern day ones, but they were more what if the world went absolutely crazy and something that literally never could have happened happened type of scenarios. They were just for fun and mostly added as free updates later on. The base 2020 doesn't really have campaigns, but base 2030 will. They've already announced that the game will release with four campaigns. Now, as of recording this, they still haven't gone in depth on what these campaigns are, but we can 
assume that this means that in addition to the sandbox, SR2030 will be taking a sort of GPS approach where they give you campaigns based on realistic modern day things that you can tackle, perhaps the war in Ukraine, perhaps China's conflicts with their bordering nations that they always decide to pick on, perhaps something a little out there, just like the SR2020 campaigns that were added. Either way, this opens up a whole new series of content, even if it is using the same setting, which it may have slightly different start dates depending on the campaign, we still don't know. Because some gamers don't just want to load up a sandbox, even if there are scripts, they want a set goal and they want to be able to accomplish it. And Battlegoat did say that they do plan on adding more campaigns later after release. So these starting four will only be the beginning. Backtracking a little bit to AI and covering what players can or cannot do, opening up the game to a wider audience, number eight, is automated battle groups. This is a feature that was ported backwards into Galactic Ruler, so I may make a separate video on this in Galactic Ruler. Maybe I already did. I don't know. I'm posting these a little out of order. But basically, Supreme Ruler has a system. This system is known as battle groups. A battle group is something, an organization, you can look at it like, of units that you can manually assign in so that you can control them at a more macro level or just keep an eye on them while microing certain parts of the map. For example, it is entirely an organizational tool until they updated it for SR2030 and, as I said, ported it back into Galactic Ruler. This new system allows you to assign a leader to your battle groups, an AI who will take control of the battle group as if you had created some new separate force, like you have AI now that control your units individually and AI that control your whole country. Well, now you can have an AI kind of in between those two where you assign units to the AI, kind of like theater controls, but you can move it around because, well, it's a battle group. This system allows you to give macro level commands such as, hey, go take this, hey, go defend that, move there to specific units where you can just give a simple order, take your hands off the wheel, and the AI will take care of the rest. Something sorely needed as I get so many questions about whether or not there's gonna be front lines. So many things saying, how can I get my units to move to the front? Because someone may not know how to work the current AI that's there, or they just may not know how to micro, or they may not want to use any of the current systems in place. This is a crazy important tool to getting a more casual audience into Supreme Ruler, which is most of the gaming audience that you could ever hope to get into any game. That's huge and that means a lot for the game and opens it up to a much wider audience than the prior games have been open to, especially because Supreme Ruler is mostly focused on economics and warfare. That's its specialty. The production, the logistics, the goods, and the fighting. Now that I say that aloud, it suddenly makes so much sense why so many Hearts of Iron 4 players are interested in Supreme Ruler. It's basically the same premise. Wow. But now, this is something that's come up a lot so far in this video, and it's about to come up a lot more, and that is... One thing you have to remember is this game is not a sequel to Supreme Ruler Ultimate. Supreme Ruler 2030 is actually a sequel to Galactic Ruler, which means there is a whole host of improvements that have already been made to the game. A whole host of overhauls, even in some of these previous points that I have made. Some of these changes are not new to Supreme Ruler 2030. They're actually from Galactic Ruler, such as point number nine, which is that this game will have Galactic Ruler's colony system, not Supreme Ruler Ultimates. Now this is big because there's some very stark differences between these. In Galactic Ruler, you can actually trade colonies as a whole. Theoretically, in 2030, that would carry over. There was no ability to do this in Supreme Ruler Ultimate. In Galactic Ruler, you could actually control the units that your colonies owned. In Supreme Ruler Ultimate, this was not possible, and thus there wasn't necessarily a point to giving colonies units. It would have to involve a very specific preference of play style whether or not you even allowed them to have military production to begin with. There were whole settings just to turn this off, but now you can control their units. So if you colonize, for example, all of Germany as the USSR, they would continue to pump out their own military and you would have control over it. In Galactic Ruler, you could play as a colony 
In Supreme Ruler Ultimate, you could not. And when you played as a colony, you also kind of got to cheat and control the units of your overlord. And assuming they're going to improve upon this system and not Supreme Ruler Ultimate system, that opens up a lot of opportunities because you could play as someone else's colony, potentially, as well as all these other things that I've already listed. And now let's move over into point number 10, which is Galactic Rulers Diplomacy, which is the most recent thing announced as of recording this video, will be brought over into Supreme Ruler Ultimate. So now what does this mean? Well, a lot of things were added to Supreme Ruler's diplomacy system in Galactic Ruler. For example, the fact that not everything is public. If you watch my SRU playthroughs, you'll know I base a lot of what I do off of publicly available information of how much military goods does somebody have, how technologically advanced is somebody. I use this information to help me win wars, prepare for them, all kinds of things, what allies to make, what I need to give someone. But in Galactic Rulers, see that game is more of a 4x blended with a grand strategy, not just a grand strategy. So they introduced the ability for certain core information to be secret without treaties to share that information, such as map discovery, such as resource stockpiles, such as research progress. Now, map discovery probably won't make it in because the game's just based on the map. And unfortunately, there hasn't been any announcements to expand into Mars or anything as we would be hoping to get to in the upcoming decade or two. But now changes have been made that they've confirmed already. We're now in Supreme Ruler 2030. We will get these improvements from Galactic Ruler, where now if someone wants to see how much military goods or other resources you have stockpiled, they're going to need a treaty from you to do it. So they're going to have to be your friend. If someone wants to see your research, how much you have, how technologically advanced you are, they're going to need a treaty to do that. This might lead to the ability to spy on someone, expanding espionage, so that you could acquire this information in less respectable means. And that's it. Those are my 10 reasons that I wanted to present to you, more or less, of why 2030 is not actually a reskin of Supreme Ruler Ultimate. And I wholeheartedly believe this fact. And I hope that you do as well. Because in reality, Supreme Ruler 2030 is not a Supreme Ruler Ultimate reskin. It's a Galactic Ruler reskin. <laughs>